Oh, to God, there is none higher. There is none stronger. There is none greater. And you are our God. Lord, we forget that. We sometimes make the adversary bigger than he should be. Lord, we sometimes give him way uh, too much power and influence over our lives. And Lord, every time we come to you, and every time we experience your power, your love, your grace, there's a thought that trickles in. It's like, why? Why, Lord, do we settle for any of the schemes of the enemy? Lord, it's because we are easily deceived. It is because of our sheer and utter dependence on your power. So Lord, as we come before your word today, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would use your power in our hearts and our minds and you would help guide us into truth. You would help us to break any bonds of slavery of sin. Lord, you would deliver us from the schemes of the enemy and you would give us freedom and you would help us to be the people that you've called us and created us to be. We praise you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Well, we're continuing our series on fighting the good fight. And uh, last week we began talking about the armor of God. And we began in Ephesians 6. Uh, and um, it's kind of interesting to hear from a lot of you. Uh, kind of feedback back on the series. And a lot of you, the, several of you, I kind of got the whole range of things that went everything like, wow, that was great. We loved it, and that was exciting to, um, man, you gave me a lot to think about, <laughs> which is good. I hope that's the case all the time. Uh, kind of a, as we kind of talk about this, a couple things from last week that I threw out there, and, and, and several of these things I kind of I pushed a little bit on some areas, uh, but one of the things that, you know, as we talk about this full armor of God and fighting this good fight and, you know, kind of the spiritual battles that are around us, there are just kind of a few things that you got to know. Number one, uh, you, you not, you know, if you are in Christ, you are in this fight. Uh, and, you know, I, people sometimes, uh, you know, I think sometimes we talk about, you know, maybe evil in this world. There's no doubt that it has influence. Uh, and we talked last week about world systems that, that evil influences just people in general and, and Christ tries to get us into these areas where, you know, just a lot of evil happens in the world, and a lot of bad things, and then, you know, humans do bad things to humans, and so there's, there's no doubt that that exists, but one of the things as we, as we are trying to kind of uh, frame this proper perspective on spiritual battle, one of the things that's kind of fascinating about it is that if you understand your theology, you do not become a child of God until you put your faith in Jesus. Now, one of the things that we have to know, if you are in Christ, you are at war with these powers and these, the, the spirits of this world. And, but, but the one thing of it is that we need to understand is if we are in Christ, we have access to weapons and armor that are so much more powerful than anything the enemy has. And we're going to talk about that today. Before we get to our text, I want to kind of give you a word picture that, I, that I've kind of picked up this weekend. I, I went and saw the movie 13 Hours. Um, if you've seen that movie or not seen that movie, um, just, a, you know, I, I, for whatever reason, you know, you do a series on spiritual warfare and fighting the good fight, you're just like drawn to all these war movies. <laughs> so I'm watching this movie, and I, of course, I'm not going to give any plot twists away or anything, and actually it was a true event, so most maybe a lot of you already know about the Benghazi events. I'll just say right off the bat that, you know, nothing political as far as that movie is concerned. It, it was just, it was a story about, you know, the events that happened in Benghazi. And, and what I found fascinating is, you know, kind of just set this up. If those of you that are familiar with uh, current events or uh, a past uh, current events, uh, Gaddafi, who was, the, who was the ruler of Libya, uh, he was actually killed by his own people. And and what happened was, is after he died, his regime ended, the people had access to all his weapons. 
Uh, and so these weapons were kind of being, uh, you know, obviously terrorists, organizations, and, and people were kind of, they're grabbing these weapons. And so the, the CIA launched this, they launched this uh, mission in Benghazi, and that mission was, they, they, they put all these people on the ground from the CIA, and they were going out into Benghazi, and they were trying to buy these weapons or get them off the streets. And so this operation is going on. Now, there was about 25 CIA agents uh, that were part of this whole uh, operation. But then there was this security detail of these six guys. Uh, and the story is actually about those guys. And, uh, you know, some of them were former Navy SEALs, Marines, uh, Army Rangers, you know, a few of them. Uh, and it's just kind of the story about this team, this security team. Now, what was interesting about this story is that, uh, so this operation is going on. These security guys were alert all the time. I mean, they would go out, they would actually pose, you know, some of the CIA agents would like, you know, they, they would go out and they, they'd be trying to strike these deals and they would actually pose as like the husband of one of the CIA agents. And so they'd be with the CIA agents, they'd be just watching everything, they're just always on alert. And just at snap, when they saw something they didn't like, boom, they just kind of reacted to it and it was kind of interesting. If you're familiar with the story of Benghazi, then what happened was an American ambassador came into Libya. He came into Benghazi, and he brought his own security force. Now, at one point in the story, these six men, the security force for the CIA and the security force for the ambassador, they, they met. And it was obvious that the guys for the CIA were way more prepared than the guys for the ambassadors. They were kind of like, oh, you know, you know, the, the, you know they, they came into the compound that the ambassador is going to be staying in, and these six guys are like, you need to get people up on that wall, you need to get security over there, you need to reinforce that gate, and they're going, and, and the security guys for the ambassador is like, eh, you know, we're only here for a few days. And it was this beautiful, they were staying at this diplomatic house in Benghazi, and it was beautiful, it had a pool and just this palatial palace, and so but one of the things that the security guys said to them is they said, well, you know what, it's the anniversary of 9-11, our advice to you is you guys hunker down and you get ready. And the security detail for the ambassador, when everything happens, if you're not familiar with the Benghazi story, but everything begins, the security detail for the ambassador, they were sitting by the pool. And they totally didn't listen to the security detachment for the CIA. They were sitting by the pool, they were kicked back, and when the bullets start flying, they're like, what was that? And they are just completely confused. And, and when everything starts happening, when the attack begins, these guys are just like, what do we do? You know, they're like, look, they're not ready. And what was fascinating is the contrast. This, these security guys for the CIA, as soon as the first bullet whizzed, within minutes, they were in their locker, they were armed, they were loaded, and they were strapped up for battle. Just this contrast. And as I'm watching that, I'm thinking, Christians today are that security detail for the ambassador. They're sitting by the pool. And they're just like, oh, you know what? Everything will be fine. And then when the bullets start whizzing, when all of a sudden the enemy attacks, they're like, well, what's going on? We need to not be. We need to understand if you are a follower of Christ, you are at war. Now, the enemy has no power against God, but too many Christians today, we have access to weapons and armor in the name of the Lord, and we are sitting there by the pool saying, well, nothing's going to happen. I'll be okay. That's not how it works. And so Paul, just to kind of give you a, just a kind of a flavor of where we're going today, uh, we kind of talked about 2 Corinthians 2, or 2 Corinthians 4 last week, well, this week, I want to take you to 2 Corinthians 2, and Paul writes this, and this is a just, if you've ever been in the military, this is powerful language. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 3, Paul says to Timothy, he says, Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. So if you think I'm going too hard with the military perspective, I'm getting it from Paul. Paul, you know, the difference between a person who's, who's a soldier and a civilian, it's just perspective. Civilians have an expectation of something easy. 
They have an expectation of comfort. You know, a soldier doesn't go into battle, and he doesn't have this expectation of there being, uh, you know, something out there that's easy waiting for them. They know they're going to be in a fight. And Paul is saying, you need to put on a soldier mindset and not a civilian mindset. You know, you watch these movies, you know, I, I'm fascinated too by, you know, special forces and, and several, a couple of Navy SEAL movies that I've watched. It's interesting, there was, uh, there was a similar scene in, in a couple of them, and it was before they got deployed, the commander brings this team together and says, now listen, now is the time to get your heads right. Now is the time to get your minds into where it is that we're going. If you got problems at home or you got financial problems or whatever it is, you got to deal with it to the best of your ability and then you got to cut it loose because we're going to war. And so that's what they do. They go through this ritual where they just they they like get their minds ready for battle. And so this is this idea as Christians, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are trying to live a life that honors God, you've got to get your perspective and your mind ready for what it's going to be like. So our text that I want to that we're going to that we've been on and we're going to get back to comes from Ephesians 6. So I'm going to read the entire text. Uh, we're going to go uh, 10 um, through verse 20. And then I'm going to read that for you. And then we're going to focus specifically on uh, three, the first three articles of armor, um, which is going to be verses 13 through 15. So uh, here's the word of the Lord, starting with verse 10. A final word, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. So this, these are the words of the Lord. Uh, we're going to be focusing on these. Now, uh, as, we kinda, as we get to this and we unpack it, there's a couple things I want to remind us about uh, the spiritual battles that are around us. So three, three specific things. As we talk about standing firm in the mighty power of God, this is what it looks like. Three things. Uh, I have a slide for that. So three things to remember. If you guys would bring that up. There we go. You got it? Three, th three things to remember about standing firm. Number one, Satan and his forces cannot overpower God. God is stronger. But you are not. Kind of an interesting piece about this is we understand, we put on the, the proper perspective, and this is where things get kind of interesting. Satan and his forces cannot overpower God. God is stronger, but they can shred you to pieces. So people who think they can stand on their own, if you're a follower of Jesus and you think you can do it all on your own, you're kidding yourself. I mean, you are just absolutely living in denial. And it's this idea that, you know, if I am in Christ and I am in God's will and I am under his protection, Satan can't do a thing to me without God's permission. But if I'm out doing things on my own, if I'm out kind of just living and kind of disregarding the armor of God and, and, and just kind of what Scripture tells me to do, man, I'm cannon fodder for the enemy. And so oftentimes I see people come in. It's like sometimes in, in, a, in a spiritual sense, it doesn't look like this, obviously, but in a spiritual sense I see so many people coming in. They're just shot to pieces. And it's like, you've you got to get, get in the Word. You've got to get into God's... Too many Christians today think they can just straddle the fence. 
They think they can just live worldly, and then, and then God will just somehow miraculously show up and protect them. It doesn't work that way. It does not. You've got to, you've got to trust the Lord. We're going to talk about that. And this is, you know, I um, just kind of give a couple of examples. One of the things that I find fascinating, this is early on in ministry, people love big events. They just love them. I mean, because there's so much energy in them, and, and you know, people are so fired up when they leave. You know, you can point to church services, you can point to, to concerts in Des Moines, and, and I think all that stuff is great. But what I find fascinating is how somebody can literally go to this mountaintop worship service experience, and then literally, 12 to 24 hours later, they can crash and burn. How does that work? See, worship and walking, now worship is a big part of our walk. But, you see, if you think that, that, that being in Christ is just moving from one experience to the next, and then you just, you're always kind of out there looking for that big mountaintop experience, if that's what you think it is, then you're going to get shot to pieces. So the idea is those mountaintop events or those great events are wonderful, and, and they're, they, they are encouraging to us. But then immediately afterwards, immediately afterwards, you've got to have your armor on you got to be ready. You know, sometimes I think to myself, and please don't think I'm crazy here, but this is what, this is what the mindset does for you. You guys are going to be leaving here in a little while. What are you going to be walking into? You're, you know, that, it, it's, like, it's like you're leaving the base, and you're going out there, and there is going to be forces that are going to be trying to get you shot up. Now, you don't have to live in fear of that if you are in Christ. But if you're not, what, what are you going to use to protect yourself? Well, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about what God gives us to protect ourselves so we don't have to live in fear, so that we can walk boldly. But it's, it's something that we have to put on. It's something that we have to do. So, so that was the first thing. So, so we talk about that God is stronger uh, but the enemy is stronger than we are. But when we're in Christ, we're untouchable. That brings us to number two. Satan's arrows are useless against God's armor. It's not like, you know, when you study armor, you know, even like modern day body armor, there's still, there's still kind of a risk. You know, there's, there's just high velocity weapons or, or there's, you know, there's chinks in the armor. You know, like there's, there's places where the body armor doesn't fit or, or whatever it is. And so there's a possibility, even though you have armor on, that you can get shot up. That's not the case with God's armor. God's armor doesn't wear out. It's impenetrable. Satan's arrows have, they don't wear it down. There's no, there's no holes in God's armor. And so that's the second thing you've got to remember. Satan's arrows are useless against God's armor. The third thing that we need to remember about standing firm in the power of God is God's people are an army. We fight together. This speaks to our lack of understanding about church theology. And I'm just, you know, I do this every so often, it's, it's time again. We have a terrible theology about church. It's kind of equivalent to going to the movie. We kind of come in with this idea that, you know, I, uh, uh, I, I want to see something. I want to be entertained. And, uh, you know, and, and if I don't like it, then maybe I won't come back for a while. Or, you know, it's, it, or maybe you're sitting at home and you know how you think, well, I haven't been to the movie for a while. Maybe it's time again. I, you know, but people have a bad misunderstanding about church theology. There's strength in numbers. God's designed it that way. You know, I, it's interesting, in Peter, Peter talks about, he describes Satan as a roaring lion looking for whom to devour. Can I just tell you, I've been to Africa, and I see how, I've actually seen lions make a kill. Do you know what they do? They isolate the prey. Lions don't attack a herd of animals. They separate the weak ones. They get them to turn away from the herd, and when, they, when they're isolated and they're alone, they devour the animals. So when Peter says that he describes Satan as a roaring lion looking for whom to devour, he's hunting for stragglers. He's looking for the people that, that aren't 
that aren't a part of the pack that think, you know what, I can do it on my own. I'm cool. I don't, I, you know, there's no, there's no war out there. I'm good. I just want to sit by the pool and enjoy life. Oh, man. Pachu, pachu, pachu. So these are all things that God gives us to help us and to strengthen us. I want to take you again, before we uh, kind of start unpacking, I want to take you to James 4. And I want to read for you as we continue to, to kind of uh, to, 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 to develop this mindset. I want to take you to James 4, starting with verse 1. James writes, What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what gives you pleasure. Sometimes I stand up here and I think, you know, and, and I speak truth to people, and, you know, people are just kind of, you know, sometimes I feel like from your perspective, it's like, oh, here we go again. Steve's talking about how selfish we are or how much we like self-indulgence. Well, that's kind of what the Word talks about. It says you don't get it, so you have things that you want from God, but maybe you don't get them from God. And the reason was is because your loyalty is divided. It's because you don't have your heads right. And what you're asking for is for God to make your life easy. It doesn't work. What you need to do is you need to be asking for obedience, and you need to be asking for to, to walk with God and to know His will. It goes on to describe these people that do this as adulterers. Verse 4, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. What do you think the scriptures mean when they say that the Spirit of God has placed within us, the Spirit that God has placed within us is filled with envy, but He gives us even more grace to stand against such evil desires? As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but favors the humble. So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Rhetorical question. How many of you here today in your heart of hearts knows that your loyalty is divided between God and the world? I'm not standing here today saying that I've got everything in the right place. I'm saying that if I lose my perspective, I start to develop a civilian mindset, which is all about worldly comfort. It's all about things being easy in the world. And you know what's fascinating to me? I'm in a position where if I do that, you know, it's only a matter of time before the realities of the world come in. Somebody calls and says, you know what, I've got cancer. Or somebody calls and says, you know what, my, my, uh, my loved one is dying right now. Or somebody comes in and they're struggling with something. Or something's going on. Or some marriage is in crisis. Or somebody's life is falling apart. Or something like that. I live in a position where I can't develop a civilian mindset that's okay i'm not supposed to if you want to understand how to fight the good fight of faith then you've got to prepare yourself for the fact that you are at war and that is just that that's the piece of it so the, so now we take that and we go back to our text ephesians 6 so we go back um we're going to pick this up at verse 13 so paul says therefore you know, just remind us, he's talking about the spiritual power standing firm in the Lord. There's going to be these forces that come against you. So therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Now remember, when you resist the enemy, he does what? He flees. When you resist the enemy in God's power, he flees. But if you're on your own power, he's looking for someone to devour. So here's that, here's that paradox that exists. So here we go. It goes on to say, again, therefore, you put on God's armor, you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil, then after the battle, you'll still be standing firm. You know, when I read that, you know what scene that I think of immediately? I think of the scene in Braveheart, or you pick any of your movies. You pick the movie, you know, maybe Lord of the Rings or whatever it is. After this big battle scene, 
there's a group that made it through. And they're all looking at each other. And you know, maybe they're bloodied and they, maybe they're wounded in battle, but they're all looking at each other and they're celebrating the victory. I, that's the same thing. I picture, I, I get this picture in the end, when the battle is over, it is going to end. This does not go on indefinitely. And I'll tell you how it ends. It ends one of two ways. It either ends with our death or Christ's return. I have, I have sat with people. I've sat with my own grandparents. And they're, just, and, and they're like, why am I here? Why am I here? And I say to them, I said, as long as you're here, you're in the fight. You're in the battle. It's a mindset. It's a mindset. So it's going to end one of two ways. But when it ends, there is going to be a group that made it all the way through. And they're looking at each other. And they are celebrating the victory. I want to be in that number. I want to look across. And I want to see people. I want to say, we made it. We finished the race. We kept the faith. We fought the good fight. And I want to be in that moment. Because you know what we're going to do? We're going to praise Jesus. Because there's not one of us that's there because it was our strength. There's not one of us that would be there because we had it all together and we were just, you know, the kingdom of God just really needed us. We'll be there because of Jesus. And we will be praising his name. But I think of that, and you know, the old saying is, is that in those moments, there will be people that you expect to be there that won't be, and there will be people that you did not expect to be there that will be. See, it's not about human strength. It's about the Lord. When we stand in that place, and we have fought through life, we battled, and we kept faithful. Can you just imagine what that's going to feel like? All the times people came against us or came against you and they, you know, the time you stood on the truth of God's word and you stood in that place and people came against you and you didn't compromise. And, it, and, it, and in that, it, it brought about ridicule and it brought about all these people that for whatever reason, they just could take it or leave it and they could, they could sit by the pool and not worry about anything. And you're sitting there, you're in this fight. And in the end, you're going to look at each other and say, you know what, we made it. You know, I, I think, you know, again, I go back to these movies. You take any movie where there's this fight, and after it's over with, the survivors look at each other, and they're like, we made it. That's what it's going to be like. And that's this picture that I have when it says, after the battle is over, you will still be standing firm. So we go on, it says, uh, it says uh, in verse 14, stand your ground, first piece of armor, putting on the belt of truth. What is Paul talking about? The belt of truth, as Paul looks at a Roman soldier, that was his word picture of a soldier in that day. The Roman soldiers wore these belts. Now, now he calls it, he, everything is an analogy, so he's walking through, so the belt of truth. Well, first of all, practically, what did the, what did the Roman soldier's belt do? Uh, you know, I, I go back and forth between translations. Some translations, which I kind of like, the, kind of the older, little tougher translations in certain cases, it says, gird up your loins. Gird up your loins. Now, part of the problem is we don't know what that means. What does it mean? Gird up your loins. That sounds kind of goofy. But let me tell you what it means. Girding up your loins. A Roman soldier wore a tunic, which is basically a dress, a toga, whatever you want to call it. Came down, you know, about halfway down to the knees, and um, it just, you know, it it was loose fitting. Uh, and and so when a Roman soldier was going into battle, what a Roman soldier would do is they would take the, the they would take it and they would reach behind, they'd pull it forward, and then they would tuck it in the front of their belt, almost like a diaper. That's girding up your loins. Now, why would they do that? Well, th a couple things. Let me give you a modern equivalent. First of all, uh, if you work around any heavy machinery with gears or anything like that, what are the first thing they tell you? Don't wear any loose-fitting clothing. Because you might get caught and you might get sucked in. So they would gird up their loins because they didn't want, they didn't actually want uh, to get caught on anything. You know, they're, they're fighting in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's not like today where maybe you know, somebody's across the way, you're hand to hand. And so there would be, uh, you know, there'd be equipment, there'd be people, there'd be all kinds of things around you. 
And heaven forbid, you're sitting there, you need to be able to move because there's stuff going on, and so you suddenly, you suddenly get caught on something. Now you can't move. So this, this, this belt actually gave you freedom. Now a lot of people think the truth isn't free. It's not freeing, it's binding. But it's, in reality, it's exactly the opposite. See, a lot of people think that you know, they can create their own truth. So, you know, one of the, one of the uh, um, you know, what a lot of psychologists say about the postmodern mindset is that people believe that now we have the power to speak truth into existence. It's true because I say it is. And I always find it fascinating. You watch, you watch Facebook, and you have all these people that are saying things, and there's a part of you just wants to say, you've got to be kidding me. But they, dec- but they say it, so therefore now, because I've said it, it's got to be true. But truth is objective, which means that truth exists outside of our agreement or not. Let me show you a couple texts. I'm going to take you first to John 18. I want to show you kind of this, this picture of what I'm talking about. Um, in John 18, we're going to go to verse 36 and 37. I'll just read it from the screen. Jesus is talking to Pilate. This is right before he's he's crucified. And and Jesus says to Pontius Pilate, he says, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, so you are a king? Jesus responded, you say I'm a king. Actually, I was born to come into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. That's either one of those truth or not statements. And a lot of people don't believe that. They think that the truth is somewhere else. They believe that, that, that maybe truth is found in, in this activity over here or that activity over there. And, and, and all the while, truth is found in Jesus. That's why it's so important. Jesus is the picture of truth. I want to take you to another text. Let's go to John chapter 8, if you would, please. Next one, if you could pull that up. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free the next one but we are descendants of abraham they said the pharisees oh what are you talking about we have never been slaves to anyone what do you mean you'll be set free jesus replied i tell you the truth anyone who sins is a slave of sin a slave is not a permanent member of the family but a son is part of the family forever so if the son sets you free you are truly free a lot of people think that christianity is just a bunch of rules and you gotta you know you gotta you know, God's a fun hater. Takes away all the fun in life away. You know what's interesting about that? You think what you're doing now is fun? Come see me in 20 years. When the enemy is using it to demoralize you. And the enemy is using it to discredit you. People spend a lot of their time, especially in their younger years, living life, having fun. And you know what happens? You get put in bondage. The very things that you think are making you free are making you a slave. This is those areas where Satan way has more power than we do. And we sit there and he says, here, do this. You know what? Try that. This will really help you. You know what? You'll really have fun and freedom if you do that. And we buy buy it, we fall for it, and then you know what happens? The trap closes. And here's Jesus. And he just says, you know what? I created you. I died for you. If you just believe me, you'll be free. We don't do it. We're not ready. We just don't believe that. But if you want to have the freedom and you want to be ready to move and you want to be able to, you know, part of standing firm and and fighting the good fight, you've got to walk in the truth. If you don't do it, you're going to be deceived and you're going to be in trouble. One of the things that I find very fascinating, and I know everybody comes to this from different stages of development, Some of you grew up in church, some of you didn't. But every single person that calls themselves a believer that doesn't read the Bible, I don't get it. 
it's got to be because you don't know what's at stake and you are sitting by the pool and you do not think there's anything there's any trouble ahead i will tell you that i read scripture every single morning and i cannot wait to sit down with the word of god because every time i do it it gives it strengthens me it's a war go back to our text we go back still back in ephesians 6 so that's the belt of truth now we're talking about the body armor of god's righteousness the breastplate the body armor uh you know it's, it's this area that you put on your torso that covers all your vital organs if somebody were going to give you a kill shot that's one of the areas they're going to aim they're going to aim center mass now why well because you got your vital organs there you got your lungs your heart Man, if they could nick any of those, maybe your liver or all of your vital organs that are vital to survival, a lot of those are found there. So that's a pretty good place to start shooting or to target. But what, but what, uh, what Paul is saying is that part of God's armor is a breastplate of righteousness. Now, what's, what's the analogy of that? Well, first of all, uh, as, as we look at Roman soldiers, that they would wear these breastplates and they would be like leather or maybe even uh, brass or, or some form of metal. And they would go over their entire torsos. And, you know, again, you know, we, I, I've been talking about, you know, football players. We talk about uniforms. Uh, you know, you can think about Roman soldiers. When I think of uniforms, I think of football players. Right? So as, as some of us are talking about Roman soldiers, you can talk about, you know, modern day soldiers and what they're wearing. Uh, sometimes I like to think of football players and and as, as we think of armor, because uh, they wear armor. And so you, you kind of, it's this idea, you know, kind of shoulder pads. You know, shoulder pads, if you ever look at the evolution of shoulder pads, when they first started, they were like, they came down to here. And now they come, they come down all the way down. They, have, they cover the ribs and they do all these things. It's in the evolution of, of shoulder pads. But you've got to cover the vital organs. Because this, this is an area where if you get hurt there, it could be a mortal wound. Now, probably the most important organ in your torso is your heart. And you have to know that that is a primary target of the enemy. Now, what's fascinating is Paul knows this too, and he uses righteousness. Righteousness as the, the equivalency of guarding your heart. What is righteousness? Righteousness is blameless before God. Uh, you know, I want to make the argument here today uh, that not only does this breastplate of righteousness protect your internal organs, I'm going to draw the line that also says it heals your internal organs because some people are coming to the kingdom already wounded, right? Some of you have past experiences or situations in your life. Uh, those years of having fun, perhaps, living free, maybe, or maybe some of you had things done to you against your will, or whatever it is. But the point is, as you go through life, because of the nature of life, we get wounded. We get, we get hurt. And so people come in, you know, as we put on this armor, there's something about this breastplate of righteousness that heals us. I, I want to show you kind of how that works. You see, as, as I'm walking through my life, and I know one of Satan's schemes, he's called the accuser. And he sits there and he says, you know, you know, just imagine, you think about your past. How often does Satan come at you and say, you know what? I know who you are. I know what you've done. I know what experiences you've had. And you know what? God knows it too. And there's no way you'll ever do anything for the kingdom of God. That breastplate of, breastplate of righteousness is when I say, you know what? It's not about my righteousness. See, I don't have to be righteous. I don't have to be self-righteous. It's not my armor. I don't have to make my breastplate. What I have to do is I have to step into Christ's righteousness. And you know what? He's perfect. I'm a new creation in Christ. So as people come at you and they say these things, it's like, you know what? Uh, yeah, that's that, but the old man is dead. I'm a new creation in Christ. I am righteous in his eyes. There is a new righteousness apart from the law. And that righteousness is in Jesus Christ. 
And so this breastplate of righteousness, it's this place where we go that Satan can't get to our hearts. Because it belongs to Jesus. You can't have it. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't even belong to me. It belongs to Jesus. And see, that's a place, when you are in that place, you cannot, cannot lose that perspective. Every so often you run into Christians that, you know, they're, they're just so angry at the world. Uh, you know, somewhere along the line, I think they just got their heart shot up. And they just never really got to that place where they put on Christ's righteousness. And there's a lot of self-righteousness in them. Because you see, if, if I don't rely on Christ's righteousness, then I have no choice but to kind of manufacture some form of self-righteousness. I have to kind of live in a degree of denial, right? Because you see, I, I, I haven't fully claimed my new identity. So I have to kind of skirt the issue or somehow kind of live a lie uh, in, in a way because I need to hide because I know deep down inside that I'm not truly righteous. But when I, my identity is in Christ, and I am living for Him, and I am completely in fellowship with Jesus, Word says, I'm free and I'm righteous. Scripture tells us, I want to read for you. Uh, if you pull up the Matthew text, please. These are Jesus' words. Matthew 6, Jesus says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he'll give you everything you need. Is that true? Or is it not true? Do you rely on the righteousness of Christ? Do you pursue the righteousness of Christ? So that's the second piece of armor. Last piece is for shoes. Put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Again, we got the Roman soldiers. They innovated this idea. They actually innovated cleats. <laughs> They put little, little studs of leather or, or metal on the bottoms of their shoes. And that way, when they were engaged in battle, they would actually stand their ground. You think about leather sandals. Anybody ever here bought a pair of leather-soled cowboy boots? You think you could stand your ground in those? You almost, the first time you hit a carpet with leather-soled cowboy boots, you better be ready because if, you, if you're not familiar with it, they're extremely slick. First thing you do after you buy leather-soled cowboy boots is you go out on the sidewalk and you go to scuff them up so you don't slip as easily. So, so leather is, is slick. And so it was this idea that, you know what, uh, to get a good footing, you've got to have cleats. Uh, you know, again, I think of cleats, modern-day equivalency of cleats. And now what Paul does is he, he uses this, he, he connects it to the gospel, and he says that it's peace. That's, that's interesting. So how, how is the gospel and peace uh, together? First of all, I want to I show you a text. I want to show you Jesus' words uh, in John 14, verse 27. You pull that up. Jesus says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. So Jesus, before his crucifixion, spending time with his disciples, he says, hey, you know what, I'm getting ready to go, but here's the gift I'm going to give you, peace. How does that work? Because we have the promise, we have the analogy of peace, but Paul connects it to the gospel itself. So let me explain to you kind of how this works. You know, sometimes you run into people that are just, oh, they're, they're kind of like, you know, if in the analogy of, they're, they're kind of like the, the security detail for the ambassador that was caught off guard, right? And as soon as the trouble started, they were flipping out, freaking out, and everything was going, oh, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? Uh, but you know, the interesting thing about peace is it reminds us, if you really study the gospel itself, it reminds us of our total dependence on Jesus. It reminds us that there was nothing in ourselves there was, there, there's, no, there's no form of works-based righteousness that I can point to, and I can say, you know what? That is a reason for my own personal pride and praises. There's nothing. 
It humbles us. And just we start to get self-righteous, or we start to, you know, we go into these conflicts. Another thing, sometimes Christians spend so much time fighting against everybody and everything. Remember, our fight is not against flesh and blood. And so, you know, we run into these situations. I, you know, I'll give you one quick example. I had a, I had a situation with somebody who, um, uh, let's see, how can I say this? They had conflict everywhere they go, and they've been to a lot of places. And the conflict is all about their faith. And they go from church to church to church to church, and every church they go to, they just start fighting with people. And I had a conversation with this person because over time they landed at our church. And they were following suit. They again were starting to fight with people. And so I had a conversation with him. And I said to him, I said, what are you so mad about? And they, they proceeded to tell me how everybody else was wrong. How all the, ah, I'm just tired, all these, you know, it's my mission in life to correct all these people. And I said, wait a minute. I said, I said, we're all a work in progress. How are you a work in progress? Well, I'm not a work in progress. Okay. But I'll tell you what gives us peace as Christians is knowing that we don't have it all together and we don't have all the answers and we have no place where we can stand and cast judgment and point fingers at others and say, we've got it, you don't. If that's how you think, you're, you're never going to be at peace. Because I sit here and I say, you know what, I don't have it, I never did, but I know who does. And I have peace. It's not about what I can do, it's about what he did. And I just, I just have to follow him and have faith in him. And there's peace in that. I don't feel like, oh, you know what, I don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, today I've got to earn God's love or else. I wake up and I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you that your promises are true, even if mine aren't. That's peace. I'm at peace with God, not because I say so, but because he says so. See, these are these shoes. So when stuff comes at you and all these things are happening and when you're ready, you've got truth. You're standing in truth. You've got your breastplate of righteousness on and you've got shoes of peace. And now as the battles come, you can stand because you are totally, you are totally in the arms of Jesus. Now, where we get in trouble is when we're not. Remember, God is way stronger than Satan, but we aren't. So for a lot of people, you know, and this is kind of an interesting thing. We live, you know, in America and Western Europe, Europe, you know, Christianity has become this religion where, you know, it's just a bunch of rituals and you, and you kind of come and you do things. And, and then what's fascinating about that is that when people cross over that line, into a biblical worldview. They're nuts. The world looks at them like they're a bunch of Jesus freaks. But what if they're just a bunch of people that have the proper perspective on the battle and they want to fight a good fight? That's the way you've got to look at it. So what are you going to do? If you are in Christ, you're in the war. Are you going to suit up? Or are you going to sit by the pool? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word today. And Lord Jesus, I do thank you for the, the wake-up call in, in, uh, in Ephesians, Lord. I thank you for this picture of being ready for battle. Lord, all we have to do is look around us, and we can see the war. We can see it plainly. But Lord Jesus, we can also see your power. Lord, we can see your triumph over evil. We can see your killing death at the cross through your resurrection. So, Lord Jesus, my prayer is, as we move into a time of response here, as we worship together, Lord, that you would help us prepare for battle, that you would help each person here according to their own unique needs. Suit up, equip up, and get ready to follow you. So, Lord Jesus, we love you. I thank you for your patience uh, as we battle through submission. 
I thank you, Lord, for your grace as we err. Lord, thankfully, it's not about our ability to make it happen. Lord, all we have to do is trust you. So, Lord Jesus, as we move into this time of response together, I just pray that you would bless each person here and you would help them get ready to fight the good fight. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. As you go out today, just know, again, the greatest analogy I ever heard is this is not a cruise ship we are on. Folks, it's a battleship. But when we trust in the Lord, we have nothing to fear. We walk in obedience and all the mighty power that Jesus Christ himself gives us. So please stand, receive this blessing. My prayer for all of you and this benediction is as you leave here and as you step into the places where God has called you, that you would step into those places knowing the love of God the Father, the grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ the Son, and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit now and always. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great day and a great week.